Well, this week uh, we're gonna we're gonna do something uh, just a tiny bit different, not too different. But last week I didn't get to get through all the text that we that I wanted to, uh, and I really wanted to get into a specific section of Colossians uh, this week because we're doing the baptism, uh, and and I just I really wanted to cover um, uh, some verses in chapter two. So. Uh, now, here's how it's going to work out is that uh, last week, the parts I didn't cover, I'm going to cover them next week uh, in addition to some other um, following text because the themes actually kind of coincide. So rather than doing a sermon on a particular topic and then today's and then a sermon on the same topic as two weeks ago, we're going to combine uh, a few verses from last week with next week. Uh, but I'm going to read through them in context today so we kind of know where we're going and uh, jog our memories on where uh, Paul is taking us. Uh, and I am very excited to get into this particular section. It's one of the richest sections in Colossians talking about just the very straightforward uh, gospel and what it is. Uh, last week, we very much looked at uh, what a, uh, a disciple is and kind of helped us define what a disciple is and how we grow in that. And um, a lot of what we talked about was that a disciple uh, grows in and learns to give out the gospel. And so uh, this week, I think it'd be good for us uh, to very, a little more clearly define what is the gospel. Uh, because we have to know that if we as disciples are gonna grow in it and learn to give it out. And, uh, and, and what that means to actually walk in it in our, in, like through our life. Uh, so before we jump into the text though, I just, I wanna say this about the gospel. For me, and I'll even say back when I was in Bible college, uh, I had this belief that the gospel is just simply what saves you. That you hear the good news, and gospel means good news. And I always had this belief that the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died for sins, that's what saves you. But then after that, then now it's up to me to be a disciple. And now I gotta start working hard you know, because uh, I, wanna, I wanna keep this good news, I wanna keep this salvation, I don't wanna disappoint God, and so thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Uh, that's kind of the ABCs of our faith, and then from that point on, then uh, we move on to, to bigger and better and deeper and richer things. But see, the gospel isn't just the ABCs of our faith, the gospel is actually the A through Z of our faith. Okay, the gospel is the beginning, the middle, and the end, that it is what saves us, it's what empowers us and equips us now, and it's actually what preserves us and glorifies us for our future. So from the beginning of life until the end of life, and then on to and into eternity, uh, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Okay, that's what Romans 1 says. It's not just the power to be saved, but it's also the power to be sanctified in our life. It's the power that actually equips us and grows us. Uh, we already saw a few weeks back that in Colossians 1, it says that the gospel actually grows inside of us. So believing the gospel isn't just this one-time event that happened for me now, it's been 16 years, but the gospel is something that, that fuels us, at least should fuel us, every single day of our life that as we meditate and think about the, the glory of God and what he's done for us, that, 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 that grows in us and it changes us, it changes our mind, it gives us a, a deeper hunger and thirst for God and it gives us a distaste for sin. And, and so, we, so, so it's one thing for us to be able to believe in the gospel, but it's a whole other thing for us to be changed by the gospel. Not, not changed by our own power or our own strength or our own ability to become better people, uh, but it's, it's a whole different thing to be changed by the gospel itself on a daily basis. Being changed from the inside out, having your mind renewed, as it says in Romans 12. I, I mean, have you ever like, thought through just some of these simple verses we've read so many times, you know, like have your mind renewed. It's like, okay, um, do you really think that by doing things you can renew your own mind? Like how would you even begin to like wash your mind? You know, so we have to just think very clearly and logically, well, I can't renew my mind. I have no power to do that, so how then do I do it? It's through the power of the gospel. The gospel is the power to salvation. Okay, and so really for the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be looking at how the gospel, first kind of what is the gospel, but then how does the gospel actually change us? How do we walk in the gospel? 
Uh, so I want to um, I want to pray, and we'll uh, jump into uh, we'll we'll get a little context, and then we're going to get into Colossians two. Father, I thank you first and foremost, Lord, for the good news that you have not just forgiven us, but you've also adopted us. And that's, that's big news because forgiveness to me is kind of what I just described where you forgive me and I say thank you and then I go on my way trying to be a good person. But uh, Lord, your word shows us time and time again that you have not just forgiven us, but you've adopted us, which means you, you call us into your company, into your family, into fellowship and communion with you. We, we are in you, we walk with you. Uh, in your word it says that we don't live uh, this life on our own, but, uh, but Christ lives through us and in us. And so we are not just uh, left alone as orphans, forgiven orphans, but we're adopted as your children and you're our father, our dad, and you are going to take care of us every single day of our life. So Lord, my prayer this morning is that your spirit would speak through your word, show us these things, make them new for us, maybe we've read them before, but make it new for us, Lord. It excites our, uh, just our affections for you. Wake us up this morning, Lord. Wake us up. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And let's open up to Colossians 1. Uh, last week we looked at Paul's ministry to the church and I talked a little bit about our ministry and what we're gonna be about as far as uh, we're always and constantly gonna be helping each other grow uh, in the word of God, prayer, and community, not as an end of itself, but as a means to bring us to God's grace, the gospel. Uh, and so those are the things we're gonna be constantly uh, making a big deal out of here at our church is the word of God, prayer, and community. And, and Paul, uh, he says here, uh, let's go to uh, verse 28 in chapter one. He says, him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so we can present everyone mature in Christ. That's where we left off, that the whole goal of, of church ministry uh, is to present the church as mature in Christ. And we believe that's done through the word of God, prayer and community primarily uh, as a means to bring us to God's grace and the gospel. So that those things in themselves don't change you. We saw last week that the Pharisees had the Bible memorized, that didn't change their hearts. They prayed out in public, that didn't change their hearts. Isaiah one, uh, the, the Israelites, they get together and they have their, uh, their, their services and they do all the right stuff as a community, but God says, that's not the point. The point is that these things should bring you to me. I, I want to be with you. I give you the word of God, prayer, and community to bring you to me. Not to just do them and mark a little box, but to bring you to me. Okay, and that's, that's what we uh, looked at last week. And then Paul says this interesting thing that we're gonna look at next week, these next few verses, but I wanna read them uh, in context. He says, for this I toil. Paul says, I'm, I'm struggling and I, I work hard to bring you guys to maturity. Like that's, that's what I toil over. Like he struggles in this. But here's the thing, he struggles with all of his, God's energy, not his own, not Paul's men, uh, energy, but God's energy that he powerfully works within me. And I want you to know how great of a struggle I have for you and for all those at Laodicea and for all those who haven't seen me face to face, that their hearts would be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he says, I say this so that you wouldn't be, uh, so no one would delude you with plausible arguments. I don't want you to go off into some other weird teachings. I, I want you to know that Jesus is enough for you. And so I'm telling you all these things so that you're convinced that Christ is enough. I don't want you to get tricked by uh, all of this other stuff that's out there. And that's what we're gonna be talking about a bit next week. Though I'm absent in the body, I'm not with you guys physically, but I'm with you in spirit and I rejoice to see your good order and the firmness of your faith. 
Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. I can't wait to jump into that one next week as well. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. And here's where we're gonna pick up today. Paul Nehir goes on a very uh, amazing uh, little journey through the gospel. And he's saying, here's why I don't want you to get caught up in all the other stuff. Here's why I don't want you to get tricked into some other weird philosophies and human traditions and false religions, because here's the truth. Here's what you really need to believe, he says. For in him, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. We covered that a few weeks ago. And you've been filled in him. You've been filled in Christ who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all of our trespasses and our sins by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What, what's, the, what's the phrase you see just a ton right there? In him, in him, with him, through him, right? So Paul wants us to know we have everything we need in him. There is nothing else that we need for life. So don't get caught up in all the stuff, all the things, and, and, I'm, and whether it's the advertising on the TV and the radio or if it's just some of this other like, stuff that we call Christianity, but it's saying that we need more than just Jesus. We need to do all these things. We need to, uh, to, to, to be a part of all these different uh, activities and things that we claim sometimes are God, but they're, they're not. And when we strive for things that we already have. And so Paul wants us to know for sure that we have all that we need in him. So let's go back to uh, verse nine and we'll go walk through this uh, step by step. In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him, who's the head of all rule and authority. Uh, the two words here, uh, fullness, uh, it's the same root word. So we see that the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Okay, he is the perfect uh, imprint and exact image of God. So the fullness, everything of God is in Christ. There's another verse that says that Jesus Christ has the spirit without measure. Okay, and now it also then says though that we have been filled in him. We have been made complete. We are full. In Ephesians 1, 3, it says that we have all the spiritual blessings of the heavenly realm in Christ. Okay, so, so it's kind of like this. Uh, right now in your life, you have everything you need for life and godliness. Okay, that's what it says in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3. All you need is available to you because you've been filled in him. Okay, now, so it's like this. Uh, if Christ is, say, like an ocean, Okay, in his, the fullness of God is like this ocean, but bigger. And now we're not God, right? So, but we're like, say a, uh, uh, I'd say like a balloon, All right? And right now you are filled to the brim. You have plenty of Christ in you. You've got everything you need, everything that, that you need to get you through your life right now. You are absolutely filled now, that might not be your experience right now. That's not what you're living out. That's not your reality, but that's why Paul wants us to be convinced that this actually is reality, even though we don't see it right now. Okay, now, as life goes on and, and 
different circumstances come and different sins kind of uh, grab you, uh, you can be m- more filled by having this balloon be stretched. Our hearts are com- uh, constantly being enlarged and our capacity is being enlarged uh, to have more of Christ, not more in the sense of we lack something now because we have everything available to us now but that as we constantly are going back to the word of God, back to prayer, back into community and fellowship and receiving the grace of God, he enlarges our hearts. He does away with sin. Every time sin is done away with, there's a little spot for more grace, right? This this sin is is, uh, taking up room in your heart and your mind right now. When that space is gone, then God's grace fills that up. And so we are completely filled. And so the thing is for us is that we need to stop chasing after something that we already have. We, we constantly are saying, God, I need, I need, I need, I need this, this, and this, and this. But he's saying, I've already offered all of this to you. It's yours for the taking. It's like, it's like if you have a, a key for a, uh, um, uh, what are those, those boxes that banks called? Those things, safety deposit boxes. You got this key to the safety deposit box and it's filled, right? But, but you're out on the sidewalk looking in the gutter, picking up a quarter. Even though you have all the spiritual blessings available to you in him because that box belongs to guess who? Jesus and we are in him, okay? And so we are able to receive all of the blessings of God in the heavenly realms. We have all this available to us, but yet we act like we are paupers. We act like we are in poverty and we have nothing. And I don't mean money poverty, I mean spiritual poverty. Like, you know, we, we complain about our sin all the time, but yet we don't actually do and, and live in the means by which he's given us to actually see our sin disappear. We just want like this this magic act to just make our sin disappear and yet he's saying, son, I've already given you the means to receive my grace and combat your sin. I've given you this great gift of of prayer. You can can be with me every day, you know that? I've given you my, my word to remind you of the great promises. I've given you people in your life and yet you sit out on the curb and you don't take advantage of all these things. You don't, you don't actually uh, go to the gospel every day. And then you find yourself in this rut, this cycle. You know the definition of insanity, right? It's doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. And we have all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms available to us. We've been filled in Christ, so we need to stop uh, acting like we haven't been filled in Christ. We need to start saying, God, now this is a slow process. Okay, so this is why we gotta be in this for the long haul. John Calvin said it this way. He said, uh, when, we, uh, when we constantly are looking for more and different, we're, say, we're, we're saying we're ungrateful for what Christ has already given us. Saying, thank you, God, for giving me everything, but I, just, I need something a little different than what you're offering. I'm not quite satisfied. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross, but yet I'm gonna do it this way instead. And we, we're constantly chasing after things that we already have. We're constantly trying to purchase things that have already been bought for us. We're, we're trying to keep God happy with us by doing a bunch of stuff. But the satisfaction of God for us has already been purchased by Jesus. And, and so we're spinning our wheels trying to get him to, uh, to, to bless us. Like we're trying to trick him into blessing us. And he's saying, I've already blessed you with everything uh, Why are you trying to bribe me? I've already given you all things. I've given you my son. Why do you think that I wouldn't give you everything else you need? But we act as if he's holding back from us. But yet he's already filled us. In your notes, I have this written down here. It says that if the measure of your own perfection... So the way you measure your life, how good of a person you are. If the measure of your own perfection is the measure of your assurance. So so you are assured of your faith. You feel confident in how much God loves you based on your activity, based on how good of a person you are, based on how much you pray. If your assurance and your confidence in your faith 
and how much God loves you is dependent on how much you pray or how much you read the Bible or how little you read the Bible. If, if how much you do those things makes your assurance fluctuate, like, like if you have a bad day spiritually, you think that God loves you a little bit less or he's disappointed in you. Okay, if that's your mindset, what you're saying is you don't believe that you're filled in Christ and you will always, always, always be a very timid, guilt-ridden, shame-filled Christian. And, and, and I don't want that for you. Paul didn't want it for the Colossian church and that's why he's saying, I don't want you to be fooled by all that false philosophy that God is this tyrannical God that, that he's just waiting to smite you even though he's already forgiven you. Like, that doesn't even make sense. But yet, our minds and our, our, our sinfulness, we just, we gravitate towards this thought. Like, we cower and we get embarrassed and ashamed that if I haven't prayed for a couple of days, I haven't read the Bible, then I, I, I don't even know what to say to God, so I just stay away. That's, that's not God. So you will always be timid if, if that's your view, that uh, God only will receive me happily and joyfully on a good day. On a bad day, at best, he'll tolerate me. But the, the flip side of that is that if the measure of the perfection of Jesus, if that's the basis for your assurance, if you say, you know what, I totally blew it today, I've been blowing it for two weeks straight, but I know that God accepts me not based on my own good works or bad works, but on the good works of Jesus and lack of bad works and lack of bad days of Jesus. If that's the case, then you are ripe and you are ready for the gospel to start empowering your life each and every day. That it, when you start walking in that every day and you're using, like we talked about last week, the word of God, prayer and community to bring you to that truth every day, you will start walking in the power of the gospel, walking as Romans says it, by the spirit. Because you don't start looking at the flesh and all the things that you're doing or not doing, but you start looking at what the spirit has done in and through you because of Christ. And when we start realizing that the gospel doesn't just save us, but actually empowers us, it starts changing our minds. It starts confronting us uh, in our disbelief and it encourages us and says, I know you don't believe this all the time, but I'm gonna finish the work that I started in you. I'm gonna continue to have my gospel grow inside of you. The Holy Spirit I put in you as a seal for your redemption and he's gonna work in you. He's gonna change you step by step, day by day. He's gonna convince you slowly but surely that I'm enough. He's gonna use my word to do it. He's gonna use your time in prayer to do it. He's gonna use the people that I've put in your life to do it. My spirit is gonna work in you and my spirit's gonna convince you that my son is enough for all of your fulfillment, for all of your satisfaction, for all of your joy, all of your peace, all of your sanctification, all of your acceptance, everything, everything. Here in 2 Peter 1.3, I referenced this earlier. It says that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So everything we need for life and godliness, okay, live a godly life, get rid of sin, everything we need has been given to us by his power. It's been granted to us. Through, through what? The knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence. That's uh, kind of uh, a longhand for the gospel, right? Because the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence, that is the good news, right? The fact that he called us to glory, that's the good news. So what he's saying here is that his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the gospel. The gospel is the knowledge of him who called us to the glory and excellence. By which, by this gospel, he has granted us, and by his power, he's granted us his precious and very great promises so that for, for this purpose, this is what the gospel's purpose is in our lives, so that through them, through these promises of the good news of the gospel, we can become partakers of the divine nature, being saved, receiving the fullness of Christ, the divine nature, and having now escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. See, the gospel is not about work. The gospel is about resting in Christ's work for us. 
key. We can, we can rest from our labor of trying to please God. God has already been pleased perfectly by Christ and now you and I, if you're a believer, you and I are in Christ. So when he looks at me, all he sees is Christ. And my acceptance uh, from God is based on Christ and that's it. And, and if I believe that and I start walking in that every day, if I remind myself of this truth every day, it changes the way that I live. Um, in the Jesus Plus Nothing book that uh, many of us are reading, uh, he quotes C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis calls these people that say that we need a little more than Jesus, he calls them the Jesus and people. That we, I need Jesus and uh, I need to work harder uh, because I've got this pornography addiction. Uh, I've got uh, Jesus, but, uh, and I also need a better job for me to be satisfied. Uh, I've got Jesus, uh, and uh, I want the perfect spouse to bring me real joy in my life. Uh, I've got Jesus, and I also need to read the Bible every single day three times for him to be happy with me. So I've got Jesus, uh, and also if I don't pray, uh, then he will be disappointed. The Jesus and people. We don't want to be Jesus and people. We want to be Jesus as enough people because when we believe that, that's, that's actually what changes us. Uh, what I want to do uh, real quick before we move into the next section, uh, I've been really uh, just blown away this last year. Blown away by so many things and uh, one of the things that I, I keep uh, telling people about when people ask, hey, how's it going? I said, you know, I've personally been just radically changed and transformed over the last year in so many ways, but my favorite thing about this last year has uh, been that I've seen so many of you guys just be changed and transformed, and your, your picture of Jesus and his love for you is just so radically different than it was a year ago. Uh, so I asked a, a few people just to share um, a couple of those things, so I, I just wanna have us here uh, from other folks in the church, what Christ has been doing in them as far as the gospel really changing them. So uh, let me first have uh, Casey Barnes come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, Casey Barnes! <laughs> come on down. Where is, uh, where's the, <laughs> hey, where's the, where's the mic at? Anyone know? Oh, right there. I met uh, Casey. Henry. Henry, he's got two names, man with two names, never trust a man with two names. Quesadilla by the fourth <laughs> through sixth graders. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Casey serves our fourth through sixth uh, ministry. I met him uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, we were at um, uh, Ashra Bennett's birthday party, right? And she just turned two a week ago, so it's probably a year and a week ago. Uh, and so uh, I've gotten to know him quite a bit, but I just want you to share with them just how the gospel has been moving in your life and in your heart the last year. All right. How much time do I got? Yeah, you can do a five-point sermon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to open up in some scripture about five months ago uh, that jumped out at my wife and I. That kind of radically changed us. Um, it's from Matthew 25. 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he'll sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations. Where'd I go? Sorry. And he'll separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry? When do we feed you or, or thirsty and give you drink? And when do we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And, did we, and when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them truly. Answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to, to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and angels, and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, 
when do when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you then he'll answer them saying truly i say to you as you did not do to one of the least of these you did not do to me and these will go away into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life that scripture rocked my heart and my wife's heart um and I remember sitting down and talking to Joby about this. I just felt like a season about four or five months ago or the gospel, the best word to describe it was I felt like I was being ruined um, in an awesome way. I felt like my life that I wanted, um, my desires were just being ruined out for Christ's desires. All this was going down, this kind of ignited a, a flame in, in both my wife's hearts. We kind of had a dream about being involved with orphanages and different things like that. Um, that's when Ted Lawler of Breath Evan first came and visited our church gateway and sparked up a relationship with him right then. Um, and just giving this desire and us to be a part of that. And we are so excited. Um, so we're seeing what's going on with that. With that whole concept of being ruined, it's opened up a whole door of confession and repentance um, and seeing the importance of it. Um, it's those small sins that are keeping us, you know, it, the little ones that we think we're silly if we tell our friend about, but they end up weighing us down. And those little sins can either develop into a, a huge issue, or as we confess them gradually over time, I feel like that those roots are getting trimmed back mm. and we can get finally to the heart of the issue, mm. which then turns into this thing called accountability and having it, and I talked about it in our community group on Thursday and just trying to press in to just, for us all to have those relationships with each other, to hold each other accountable to God's word and God's standards of what he wants us to do. Um, and it's a great thing when you form these relationships. I'm gonna tell you a funny story real quick. Last thing before I leave you. Um, I have a couple guys that I'm able to be open with. I shared this on my group on Thursday. Um, my buddy Brandon and I hold each other accountable in the morning. We get up at 4.30 before we go to work so we can spend that time to fill ourselves with God's word and prayer. And <laughs> last week, um, I wrote him a text and said, dude, I didn't get up till 5.30, you know? I was being lazy. And, uh, so he kind of chuckled, and then he wrote back to me, said Proverbs 6, 9. So I look it up, and it says, How long will you lie there, O sluggard? <laughs> when will you rise from your sleep? <laughs> and how blessed I am to have a bro do that. You know, it is funny and stuff, and I did laugh, but now I got it set on my alarm on my phone. I have that verse. So, anyway, awesome. right. uh, thank you guys awesome. Awesome. for this opportunity. Well, thanks, Casey. Uh, Janae, was Janae in here? Where's Janae at? There she is. Janae's been going to uh, Wednesday morning uh, Bible study uh, with my wife, and my wife keeps telling me just amazing things that she's been hearing from you, so... Um, share with them just what's been going on in your life uh, the last uh, however long, a few months or so. Well, a little background story on me. I've been raised in the church as a Christian, and my parents were Christians growing up, and I had always heard about Jesus and accepted him in my heart when I was very little. But um, I feel, I kept telling Katie, like, I feel like my eyes are being opened for the first time. I feel like this veil's been lifted off, and I'm seeing things. I feel like God just totally took me from a stage of being bottle-fed to, like, shoving sol solid food down my throat right now. <laughs> and um, first of all, God really showed me like how, like the supremacy of Christ, like learning about that in Colossians has just rocked me in a way to understand the bigness and fullness and greatness of Jesus and of our God and how powerful he is. And I feel like our world, especially right now, has watered down Jesus for us. They've taken this God, who is everything, and we've made him like this side, like this, oh, like Jesus is love, and he's wonderful, and, and I, I was okay with that, and yeah. knowing and understanding the love, like, the greatness of our God helped me to understand the salvation that's offered to me, because 
this great, amazing God who created everything, like, chose me. And that's where this all gets so crazy to me. Like, if you know me, I am such a sinner. And the fact that, <laughs> I mean, the fact that God chose to reconcile himself to me through his son, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, in under, to understand salvation and that gift, you have to understand how amazing God is and how little you are. Yeah. And understanding that has just completely changed my faith in God. It's brought it to a new level. Um, my walk with God and just to think how silly it is to do anything but serve him because he chose me and why I still am trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, and I think that, that um, what God first showed me was to just stop and like, bask and like sit in that sweet spot in that moment of knowing how great he is and I first had to stop and do that and then um, to understand like the grace and the gift the free gift of salvation that he gave me and then um, in turn like it just makes me want to tell others and that's like the cool full circle and like yeah. you were talking about yeah. last week and being a disciple mm -hmm. and bearing fruit I think when we fully grasp the love that God has for us and that concept and it really goes from like we've been talking in our group from head knowledge to heart knowledge mm -hmm. you can't not be moved and so fruit will come because you can't know this and not have it impact your life in a big big way yeah. and um, the verses that I really have loved so much um, in Ephesians 1 4 it says for he chose us in him before creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight um, he chose us before he even created the world and that is just I feel so grateful and so honored that he chose me. And then in Ephesians 3, 7, and 8, Paul says, I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and make plain to everyone the administration of the mystery, which is Christ in you. And I just feel so grateful that God has given us you to help us understand and um, and in turn, I just want to be that disciple of mm -hmm. disciple for God and just give back and yeah. show people what God's shown me. So I'm just really grateful. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. How many of you guys relate to that? You say, man, if you just knew me, I am such a sinner. <laughs> that was perfect. Uh, one more. Brandon Adams. Brandon, where's Brandon at? There you are. This is Brandon Adams. Brandon fearlessly led our softball team to a stunning record of what was it? Two, two and eight. To, well, we got playoff to, team, though. Well, we got to playoffs. So. It's too soon, though. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah. just leave that alone. <laughs> okay, so um, just a little backstory on me. Um, grew up in the church. Um, went to Lutheran Church my entire life. Parents very active. Um, but my understanding of Christianity and, and my view of God was just, it was just skewed. So um, I'm in college um, five, six years ago essentially taken a hiatus from my, my Christian walk. Um, I'm out in front of my house that I share with, with three of my college roommates, and a guy's walking down the street, and he stops, and he goes, can I ask you a question really quick? And he's just on the sidewalk, I'm in my front yard, and I'm thinking, oh great, you know, here we go again. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. He's like, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. <laughs> and he goes, uh, are you saved? And I said, yeah, I think I'm saved. He goes, okay, no. he, goes, he goes, why do you think you're saved? And I was like, well, I mean, I know that Jesus Christ is my Savior, and uh, I mean, I go to church, and uh, I feel like I'm a good person. And he kind of stops, and he looks at the ground, and he smiles, and he looks back up at me, and he goes, he goes, God's grace. And I, I was like, what? He's like, he's like, you're saved through, by God's grace. And so, obviously, that moment in my life um, stood out to me, because here I am telling you guys. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it's taken uh, until this last year to really understand the full meaning of that. And um, whether it be, you know, th through what God's speaking through Joby or, you know, me getting in the word or, or um, listening to other pastors and, and their messages, um, prayer, community group, um, I just, I, I now realize that it's, it's not, it's not about me. It's not about me earning my salvation. It's not about me checking off boxes. It's about 
the fact that God has chosen me, that Jesus Christ earned my salvation by dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And no matter where I've been and what I've done and where I go and what I do, God's always going to meet me right where I'm at. And um, I guess that's just something that's really sank into me, and I just, I just hold on to that. Mm -hmm. um, now, in light of all that, that doesn't, knowing that I have salvation, it doesn't mean I want to throw my feet up, you know, and sit on the beach somewhere. It's actually motivated me to pursue my relationship with God even more yeah. and, and to be a disciple. And um, I, just, I just see so much fruit um, in my life, not by my own works, not by my own doing, mm -hmm. but, you know, I see my marriage, I see my, my uh, being a father, um, in personal relationships, um, it's just it's just been amazing to see, and um, this heart change isn't like I said anything. It's not a reflection of what I've done. It's just um, it's truly what the Holy Spirit has been doing in and through me yeah. um, through the gospel. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right, a couple more minutes of going through. Uh, uh, the last couple of verses here. And I just love hearing these stories. I know there's so many more out there. And it's just uh, absolutely amazing to see what God is doing uh, in our church family uh, in so many ways. Uh, let's look at uh, verse 11 here. Colossians 2.11. Going through a couple of these verses here before we close up. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Now circumcision... Uh, was the outward sign in the Old Testament to show that you were a Jew, okay? It was the outward sign that said, I believe in God, I am a Jew. Uh, but now, uh, Paul's saying there's a, a different circumcision that isn't outward, but it's inward. Uh, it's the circumcision of our hearts. The circumcision uh, showed, uh, it was a symbol of the flesh being cut off of us. So our sin, our stubbornness, our obstinance being cut off of our life. But he's saying that the, the point of circumcision was just to show outwardly what was going on on in the inside. And, and so now though, we're, we're, we're circumcised in our hearts. That in our hearts, the flesh, our sin is cut off from our hearts and done away with. And here's how it happens. See, it's a circumcision made without hands. We can't do it. Okay, you can't like circumcise your heart. This is how it happens. By putting off the body of flesh, not just, uh, just, not just a, a portion of our flesh, but by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And speaking of the death of Christ, putting off his whole body, not just a little piece of his body, but his whole body was crucified, that his body of flesh was circumcised in a whole kind of a way, not just a part of him, but in a whole way, he, his body of flesh was put off it was cut for us. And then now we've been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So here's the thing, is that God, see God is a good judge and so he can't just look at us and look at each one of you guys and say, you know what, I'm angry at your sin. Now, this is when you were a non-believer. And if you're a non-believer now, uh, I have to tell you right now that God has uh, a angry wrath towards your sin. Okay, he, he is a good and holy and perfect God and he hates evil. He hates sin. And so here we are, He's looking at us saying, uh, I'm, I'm angry at your sin. I have this wrath and God cannot, because he's a good judge, he can't just ignore it. He, something has to be done with sin. Something, ha it has to be done away with. So he can't just sweep it under the rug and say, hey, you know what, I forgive you. See, something has to be done. Your sin has to be destroyed somehow and he's either gonna destroy it by crushing you but he doesn't want to do that. He, see, he's a God of justice, and, and he will do it, but he's also a God of mercy and grace. And so he says, you know, because I, I love you, I'm, I'm going to send my son. Uh, I'm going to send him to the earth, and he's going to live the life that you never could. He's going to have an endless streak of good days. He will never have a bad day. He'll be tempted 
but he'll never give in. And at the end of his life, what I'm gonna do for you is I'm gonna uh, take all of your nasty sin and I'm gonna take all of my anger towards your sin and I'm gonna put it on him. And I'm doing this for you because I'm a good and gracious God and I, 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 I wanna have grace and mercy, but I have to do something with your sin. And so here's God. God uh, cannot spare his wrath. He's gotta do something. His wrath is boiling over in him. We've been testing him for thousands of years. Individually, I've been testing God for 18 years pushing the envelope, pushing my limits with God. His wrath was boiling over. He had to do something with it, and he could have just put it all on us and asked us and required every single one of us to pay for our own sins. He could have looked at each one of us and said, you owe me. You've offended me. You've committed cosmic treason against me. I'm the Lord of the universe, and you've turned your back on me. You owe me. But instead, what he did, because he could not spare his wrath, he had to put it somewhere. He said, you know what? Instead, I'm going to send my son. He's going to live this perfect life, the life you never could. He doesn't deserve an ounce of my anger, but I'm going to give it all to him for your sake. I'm gonna give it to him because of my love for you because I'm a merciful and gracious God. And so here's the thing, guys, is that, that let's start thinking real quick about your sin. Think about the secret sins in your life. Okay, think about the sins that you did that you just wish no one ever would have ever known about. Think about the sin that that you just you still just feel like you're you're holding on to it the sin even that maybe your friends and family have not forgiven you of yet okay here's what the word says about that Verse 13, you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses. And here's how he does it. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, okay? There is a legal demand on your life. That legal demand, the penalty of your sin is death. That's the legal demand. That's what you owe, Okay, this is not like a $471 fine by going in the, uh, the, the carpool lane. You owe your life. But he canceled that debt, not just by sweeping under the rug. No, he can't do that. See, he is a good, righteous God. He's a good judge. He will punish sin. How did he do it then? He set it aside, nailing it, to the cross. Now, now, I want you to get a really vivid picture of this here because we're not just talking about the crucifixion, but over the head of Jesus was what? A sign. They, they, they posted a sign. And, and the sign, when these convicted criminals were crucified, they put a sign over their head to say what they committed, the crime they committed. What was the crime that Jesus committed? He claimed to be the king of the Jews, right? So over his head it said, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Did he commit that crime? No. Why? Because he is the king of the Jews. That wasn't a crime. But what God the Father saw as he looked at that inscription above Jesus said, wasn't this fake, phony, trumped up charge. Jesus didn't die because he was the king of the Jews. He died because he took on our sin. And so that, that sign above his head, uh, see, these, these Romans, they, they thought they're all powerful by crucifying the king of the Jews, but they didn't realize that God the Father sent Jesus for the purpose of dying. And so the reality is that inscription over his head did not say Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's not even a crime. He did that. He is that. But on that inscription, in the eyes of God the Father, the holy judge, was every sin that you and I have ever committed, that above the head of Jesus, it says, adulterer. It says, bitterness. It says, unfaithfulness, anger, rage, 
unforgiveness. It says abortion. It says sexual immorality. It says murder. It says pornography. Jesus became our sin, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became our sin. That inscription, the, the accusation that hung above his head on the cross, he became our sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. He was up on that cross for all the world to see, naked and ashamed on this cross crucified hands and feet with this inscription that said, murderer, adulterer, every sin, every sin that you've committed, those secret sins that no one knows about even, those were written above his head on the cross. They were nailed to the cross and done away with for all eternity. So let me just set you free real quick by telling you, you do not have to forgive yourself for those sins. Why? Because Christ already forgave you for them. You can walk in that freedom. You do not have to forgive yourself because God's forgiveness is far more powerful. You can live in that freedom of the gospel. You don't have to purchase anything that's already been purchased for you. You don't have to buy anything that's already been given to you freely. There's nothing else that you need for God to be happy and satisfied with you because of his son, because of his good grace, because he's a loving God that burned with anger towards you but he had grace and love towards you because he loves his son and you're in his son. That in Galatians 2.20 it says that we've been crucified with Christ so when he sees your life, he sees as if you've already paid the price through Christ's crucifixion. You've been crucified with him. So it's no longer I who live but it's Christ who now lives in me. So even now today, this is not just a past event but that Christ lives in me now and today so when he looks at me now and today, he still sees me as the perfect Christ even though I'm not. Even though as Janae said, if you knew me, <laughs> You'd know that I'm such a sinner. But it is Christ who lives in me now. Because all my sins were nailed to the cross and hung above his head. And he took on all the wrath and anger and fury of God towards my sin. He took it all and it crushed him. But before it crushed him, he, he rose his eyes to the Father and he said, it is finished. It's done. Everything needed is done. There is nothing else you need for life and godliness. You've got all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. You have everything available to you. Over the next week or so, we're going to be looking more deeply than how does this happen? How can we start walking in these truths? Okay, we, we've, we've heard now what the gospel is. We know the reality of the gospel. So now, how can we appropriate that every single day so we can start seeing changed hearts, changed minds, changed lives? Because I, I know, guys, that, uh, and I'm, I'm right here with all you guys, that uh, I don't remember this every single day. I wish I did. I wish I remembered every single minute that I'm striving in my flesh to make something happen. Uh, we need each other. We need the word of God. We need prayer in order to keep us anchored to the truth of the gospel. All right, we gotta be in this together, committing to each other. And we need to constantly be uh, encouraging one another, uh, texting each other. Every once in a while, you'll come here, I'll be yelling at you, okay? Uh, because I know we wander, all right? And, and I, I, want us to, I want us to believe this. I want you to be free. I want all that guilt and that shame gone. You don't, you don't need it anymore. It's not yours. Christ took it, paid for it, put it to death. Okay, he put death to death, all right? Like, that's amazing. So um, let, me, let me close with two more scriptures real quick. Sorry. <laughs> Colossians 2.15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Okay, uh, all the demonic 
everything, uh, Christ triumphs over them. So uh, John says in 1 John 4, 4, uh, little children, you are from God and you've overcome them, those spirits that are in the world, those spirits that try to condemn you and bring that guilt and shame back to you. He who is in you is greater than he who's in the world, okay? Romans 8, 37, this is the last verse here. In all these things, now this is after Paul talks about how there's no condemnation in Christ and that how he's chosen us and he's gonna glorify us and then he says this, in all these things, uh, speaking of, of, of death and all kinds of uh, tribulation, we're more than conquerors, okay? We're more than conquerors. So conquer, like that'd be pretty sweet. We're more than conquerors. More than conquerors, not by our own works, but through him who loved us. And I'm sure, Paul says, I'm positive that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things in the present, nothing in your present life, nothing now that is happening today, nor anything in the future, okay? Nothing, past, present, or future, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else. And so just in case that wasn't clear enough, Paul's saying nothing else in all creation, like the trump card. Okay, not even you. Are you part of creation? Yes. Not even you can separate yourself from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. It's not in you. If it was, then bummer. But it's in Christ, right? It's in Christ. That's how we receive the love of God. It's all through Christ. God the Father's love for Christ. And if you're in Christ, you get all the love from God the Father towards Christ. Uh, let's, uh, man, I'm excited. I'm excited that God is doing this in us. I pray that today these, these words, this, the, the scriptures would just uh, awaken you a little bit more, like smelling salts just kind of shoots you out of your seat. Uh, I hope that you're able to stick around because we've got some baptisms today and I'm just really excited about that. Really excited to, to have this time where we can celebrate people that have acknowledged that Christ has put off their sin by his body being crucified and now they want to celebrate and they want to acknowledge with their church family, Jesus has saved me. Father God, we are so grateful. Lord, we are uh, amazed at your good grace, at your love, God, we know that we are a sinful people. And we know that even if we were to live by our own standards, we still fail, let alone living by your standards. We're imperfect even by the world's standards. We've all done something. And yet you freely gave us your son Jesus and your word says that whomever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life and God my prayer is that even right now there be people in this room who uh, maybe don't know Jesus today they have not believed in him and I pray that your word would uh, open their eyes open their hearts their ears that uh, that they you would show them that you have love for them and that you showed that love through your son on the cross I pray for uh, folks like uh, Janae and Brandon who uh, maybe grew up in the church and maybe were just very blinded and they lived a life of religion there are people here who need to be woken up out of their slumber Maybe they really are believers and just sleeping, or maybe they're not, and they think they are. I, I don't want them to be deceived any longer. So God, by your grace and by the power of your spirit working through your word, uh, I, I ask God that you would open their eyes today to the beauty and sacrifice of the person and work of Jesus Christ, what, you, what he has done for them on their behalf. Thank you, Lord, for not just forgiving us, but adopting us as your own. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.